Well, it's getting to be the end of the fall semester, and at least on the U.S. class schedule, that means that students in Calculus 2 on the standard track of Calc 1, starting everything off and leading up to definite integrals, fundamental theorem of calculus, that kind of zone, Calc 2 picking up from there and continuing on through infinite sequences and infinite series, and getting ready for Calc 3 through the introduction of polar coordinates and parametric equations. Seems like since that semester is coming to an end, might be a good time for an overall review of uh, how to decode parametric equations. And I'll say more about what that means in a minute. Uh, this is gonna be an interesting video perhaps because I'm looking at my, uh, my little recording bar. I use Camtasia to record these and it's showing me my own webcam image in black and white. So it's not until I'm done recording that I will find out if I'm truly appearing in black and white or in vibrant color. But as long as you can hear me and see the slides, it's all good. Okay, so we're gonna talk about parametric equations. This is gonna be a whirlwind tour of a whole bunch of stuff, but mostly centered around how to decode them. Uh, in other words, if you see parametric equations describing a curve, can you figure out if there's a more normal or routine way routine way of writing that curve, like y equals some function of x. Okay, now there are advantages to parametric equations, but sometimes it can be a little more difficult to just imagine what curve is being presented to you. And so we learn how to make those connections right away. But before we get there, let's just make sure everybody's cool with parametric equations to begin with and sort of how they operate. So way back in the beginning, sixth grade, I have no idea anymore. The very first time you ever actually made graphs of functions like y equals x squared or y equals one over x or something like that. So you had one of these formulas. The way you would draw them, you should probably make a table and you'd pick a bunch of values for x like negative three, negative two, negative one, zero, one, two, three, right, in a table. And then you'd use your formula to calculate all the corresponding values of y that went with those x values. And then you would take these pairs of x, y that you just made and treat them as a point in the coordinate plane, plot those points, make a bunch of dots, and then you'd play connect the dots and you'd get that curve. And ta-da, you have completed the graph of that y equals f of x, okay? So we selected a bunch of x values and we picked the y values that were obtained from those x values. Parametric equations work pretty much the same way. It's just there's a new player in the game. It's called a parameter. I see the dog has just entered the room. I don't have a ghost. That door swung open because of, uh, because of Tux. This is Tux. He wanted to listen to parametric equation talk. Okay, so we pick a parameter, which is going to generate both of the values of x and y. I mean, generically, we call this parameter t, but you can make it anything you want. You're in charge. So we have a formula that tells us how to take these values of t of our parameter and turn them into x coordinates. And we have a different formula that tells how to turn our values of t into y coordinates. And now we go do what we did years and years ago, where we might think about just make pick a bunch of values of t negative three, negative two, negative one, zero, one, two, three, something like that. And then we take those values of t and use them to generate all the x coordinates and all the y coordinates. But now that we have a set of x and y coordinates, we take those pairs in our table, we go draw those points in the coordinate plane, and then we connect the dots and ta-da, you've now drawn another graph, this time of a parametric curve. Seems like a lot of extra hassle to introduce this extra player in the game, but there are some advantages because we can generate more curves that are more interesting in a lot of cases than a y equals f of x type of curve, or even curves that are written explicitly, like the equation of a circle is generally presented as x squared plus y squared equals the radius squared. If you solve it for y, then you only return either the top or the bottom. Okay, uh, but x squared plus y squared equals r squared is the standard equation of a circle. But even given that, parametric curves can be a lot more interesting and have a lot more variety. 
everything that we can write down as y equals some function of x can be expressed as parametric equations just with a little, a little trick. You just let x be t <laughs> and then y equals f of t and now you have two equations based on t that generate exactly the same curve as y equals f of x. Okay, but there, again, there are lots of curves that it can be more efficient to write parametrically. There are some curves that just can only be presented parametrically. We can also use parametrics to indicate direction of curves. Uh, in fact, parametric equation curves come implicit with a, with a direction because we move along the curve in the order dictated by increasing values of t from whatever it started at to whatever it ended at. So not only do we have a curve, but we have like an implicit sense of direction along that curve with parametric equations. It is also easier to present clipped segments of curves with parametric equations, right? Usually if you describe a parabola, you just give its equation, y equals x squared plus five, right? There's a parabola. But what if you just wanna clip out one segment of the parabola? Well, you can do that more easily with parametric equations because you present that function that is going to generate all the x coordinates out of our t values. You have an equation that generates all of our y coordinates out of those t values. And we also present the, the range of values of t that we use all together. t is going to go from 0 to 10, or t is going to go from minus infinity to infinity, or whatever it is. But that's a crucial part of the description of a parametric curve. So it's very easy to describe a curve segment and also the direction in which we traverse the curve. Okay, so here's a very, very simple example. Parametric equations are x equals t and y equals t. t goes from zero to one. Now, if x is equal to t and y is equal to t, then this curve is also known as y equals x. It's the, straight, the perfect diagonal, very generic straight line. And since t only goes from zero to one, the only portion of this line that we're interested in is from zero, zero to one, one. And we move from the point zero, zero to the point one, one. So y equals x, it's usually the whole line. If we describe it with these parametrics instead, we've now specified we only wanna clip this one segment and we want to go from the origin up to the point one, one. So there's a lot of extra good dynamics going on here. It's also easy to do things like reverse that direction. So if we change the equations to x equals one minus t and y equals one minus t, we still have a scenario where y and x are the same. So this is the curve y equals x, except now the first value of t, zero, puts us at the point one, one, and the final value of t puts us at the point zero, zero. So it's the same line y equals x, but clipped between the origin and the point one, one. The first version took us from the origin out to one, one. The second version is taking us from the point one, one back to the origin. So you get clips of segment, clips of curves, and you get directionality depending on how the parametrics are set up. Now, that's just the big story about parametric equations. The specific thing we wanna focus on here is if you're given a set of parametric equations that describe a curve, can you decode the parametric equations and just figure out the, the more regular y equals f of x type of curve, or maybe the more implicit type of curve like x to the fourth plus y to the fourth equals seven. I mean, that's a curve and it's circle-ish. Um, and it can be written as in parametric form and it can be decoded perhaps to learn that that's what it is. All right, so there are a handful of ways that we can generally do this in a routine fashion. One is you just plot the curve. You make those tables of points and you pick out all your X and Y coordinates that both got generated from your values of T in whatever range you've given. And you draw those dots and you play connect the dots and you go, aha, I just made a parabola. And I can tell you the also known as version of this parabola is Y equals, I don't know, four minus X squared or something like that. That takes a lot of work though, to plot point by point and then play connect the dots. Uh, prayer, tarot cards, or psychic vision, meaning you just had some sort of insight 
right? You saw the parametric equations and you saw how they linked up and it just came to you out of the sky. That doesn't happen often. The standard way to do this is called eliminating the parameter. And that means we take the equations for X and the equations for Y and we basically have them handshake with each other to pass information between them so that you can figure out the Y equals F of X version. Okay, we can also consider this um, eliminating the middleman. Okay, now how do we do this eliminating the parameter or eliminating the middleman or taking our parametric equations that involve T and have them handshake in a way that they connect together so that T is get, gets kicked out and we only have X's and Y's left, okay? One of them is when it's obvious, okay? I'm gonna scroll back up, right? Even with no introduction to parametric equations, this one example we started with, if X is equal to T and Y is equal to T, it's pretty clear that Y is equal to X because of the transitive property of equality. And so X equals T, Y equals T is part of the line Y equals X. And similarly for the slightly more complicated case, the recipes for X and Y in this old example were the same thing. So Y equals X. And that was, you know, it was obvious. Another way to do this is to take one of the two equations for X or Y and solve them, solve it for T and then plug it into the other one, thus eliminating T. That's why it's called eliminating the parameter. Um, and the other way is to sort of handshake or meet in the middle with the two equations. And that'll make more sense once we see an example. So here's another example of the it's obvious type of thing. Uh, X equals T, Y equals two minus T squared for T going from minus one to one. What is the also known as version of this curve in just Y equals F of X format where there's no more T's? Well, if X is already just T, then with a direct substitution, uh, y is just two minus x squared because t is equal to x. So this is a portion of the parabola, parabola y equals two minus x squared. Which chunk or which clip of the parabola? Well, that depends on these t values, okay? The first point on this clipped portion of the parabola starts at t equals negative one, and that gives us an x coordinate of minus one and a y coordinate of two minus one or one. And then the final point on this clipped portion of the parabola ends at t equals one. Uh, and that will be when x is one and then y is one as well, the second time. Okay, um, here is a picture of that. These parametric equations form this parabola. We start at this point on the left and we follow the curve to this point on the right. So I wanna stress this. We've taken the full parabola y equals two minus x squared and we've clipped out part of it and assigned direction, okay? That is the benefit of writing this parametrically, but fundamentally this whole mess of x equals t, y equals two minus t squared, well, that's just also known as the parabola y equals two minus x squared if you don't wanna mess with the t's anymore. Here's another one where I would still call it quote unquote obvious, even though it might be a little bit less obvious, I'm still looking for a way to take the information about x and substitute it in for into y. Um, we could just solve this for t, solve the x equation for t and have t equals x over two, and then plug that in, in the y expression for t, okay? Um, but remember, I'm just gonna do this in the reverse order because I just reminded myself of that when I clicked down on the slide. Uh, but just to emphasize that we can get the first and last points regardless of whether we found the also known as version of the curve. Right, so when t is negative one half, uh, x is going to be negative one, and when t is negative one half, if you follow it through, y is also going to be one. When t is positive one half, x is one, y is one. Okay, now to the handshaking part of this. Again, we could either solve T and write T is X over two and then plug that in here and shake it down for Y. Or we could do something a little bit more clever and say, wait a minute, four T squared is just two T, the quantity squared. And that two T 
uh, is x itself. And so this is y equals two minus x squared. And then, wait a minute, isn't that the curve? Isn't that this curve? Uh, well, yeah, it is. So these parametric equations give us the same visual curve with the same starting and ending points as the other set of parametric equations we looked at did. So is it exactly the same? And the answer is, well, yes, but also no. Uh, yes, it visually looks the same. It looks like this, okay? However, um, with the original parametric equations, whoops, I don't wanna go back too far, okay? Um, when x is t and y equals two minus t squared is giving us this curve and t changes from minus one to one, imagine a little calculus car driving along this curve and it's moving according to a rate set by how fast t is changing from minus one to one. Uh, so here the x coordinate would be changing exactly at the same rate as t. And so we'd have a nice slow, I don't know how, I don't know if it's slow or fast, but you know, there's a particular rate of change or a speed quote unquote that we would follow this curve. In the second example, the curve is visually the same one, but because we have different expressions for x and y, we're moving along the curve at a different quote unquote speed uh, as t goes from minus one half to positive one half, okay? And so, yeah, they're kind of the same curve, but below the surface, there is a slight difference. All right, another way to decode parametric equations is to take one of them, solve it for t, and then pass it off to the other one. So here we have x equals two minus square root of t and y equals t cubed. And t is gonna run from zero to four. Uh, I don't particularly wanna solve the y equation for t. I would rather solve the x equation for t and then plug it into the y equation. So then I will have y equals some function of x. Okay, but just like before, just to get some anchor points, let's take a look at the first and last points. When t is zero, x is gonna be two and y is gonna be zero. When t is four, x is going to be zero and y is going to be 64. And of course, every time I do a video, Zoe starts barking. You might hear that in the background, especially now that Tux opened my door. Now Zoe is barking more loudly. She's probably jealous that somebody is outside giving their dog a walk and here I am talking about parametric equations. Be patient, Zoe. We'll go for a walk after I'm done with this. Okay. So whatever curve this is, it's gonna connect the points to zero and zero 64. That's gonna be quite a, quite a range there. How do we figure out the y equals f of x version? Well, let's go to the x equation and let's solve it for t. So we, uh, we add the square root of t to one side, subtract the x and get square root of t equals two minus x, which means that t is equal to two minus x squared. Then we plug that into the equation for y. So y equals t cubed originally, but now we have t equals a function of x. Plop that in there like this. Maybe do a little simplification. So this is the curve two minus x quantity to the sixth, starting at the point two zero and ending at the point zero sixty four, And that looks like this. So down here, we have the point two zero. Up here, we have the point 0, 064, and here we go along that curve. We got a starting point, we've got an ending point, we've got a direction. Um, and so again, if you wanted the whole entire y equals two minus x raised to the sixth, fine, you've got it. But with these parametrics, it's very simple. Just go clip, clip, take out this one piece of the curve and actually assign direction to it. And that's the benefit of parametrics. Okay. The last good way to get parametric equations resolved to their y equals f of x form. Now, both of the dogs are downstairs barking. Is to handshake without really doing any solving. It's just recognizing some clever way to couple the equations together so that t gets shown the door and you're only left with x and y. And here's a very, very standard example of how this works. Now, again, let's just put our anchor points in place. Uh, when t is zero, uh, x equals three cosine t will return x equals three times one, 
or three, and y equals three sine t will return three times zero, or zero. And then at the other end, t equals pi, well, that gives us three times negative one for x, three times zero for y. So the first and last points of this curve are three zero and negative three zero, so two locations on the x-axis. What happens in between? Well, you've got sines and cosines, and try to remember your very favorite trigonometric identity. It's everybody's favorite. If we square both of these equations, we'll have x squared equals nine cosine squared and y squared equals nine sine squared. Now suppose we add them together. Then we'll have x squared plus y squared equals nine cosine squared plus nine sine squared, both of t. And maybe we factor that nine off on that right hand side and now we have cosine squared t plus sine squared t or if you want to see it the other way sine squared t plus cosine squared t what's everybody's favorite trig identity sine squared plus cosine squared equals one so by taking these two parametric equations squaring them and adding them up we allow this handshaking between the two equations that turns all of the stuff including about t uh, into one and so this thing shakes down to the curve x squared plus y squared equals nine. And now this means we have a circle of radius three centered at the origin, right? Well, sort of, uh, because remember, we only, we have starting and stopping points of three, zero and negative three, zero, which means we don't have the whole circle. We have half the circle. Now we're going to start at three zero on the x-axis and end up at negative three zero on the x-axis. Are we going up and over? Or are we going down back up? Because we know we're on this circle, but how do we get from the left end point to the right end point? Up and over or down and up? Uh, if we're on a clock face, right, we're, we're stapled this curve at three o'clock and nine o'clock. This is an analog clock, by the way, of course. Do we go up and over through 12 o'clock or do we go down and up through six o'clock? Well, to figure that out, all we have to do is pick a different point. Um, T uses everything from zero to pi. Now we used zero and pi, the endpoints, to figure out where our thumbtacks go for this curve. Uh, pick something convenient in between there, like uh, pi over two. What X and Y coordinates happen when T is pi over two? Well, we end up with the point zero three. And so now we know that if we start at three zero, we go up and over to zero three and then down to the other side. So we start at three o'clock, go up through midnight and over to nine o'clock. So we're going counterclockwise around the circle of radius three centered at the origin, the top half of it. So this is what we've drawn. Uh, not just, we don't have the whole circle because of the bounds of T. We're starting over here on the positive X axis. We're going counterclockwise around the top half of the circle. We're ending up over there at negative three zero and that's it. The parametric version of this curve makes it easier to specify those endpoints and that direction without a whole lot of extra baggage. Okay, let's have a little fun with this. Um, x equals three cosine t, y equals three sine t for t going from zero to pi. That's what we just resolved, right? It's the circle x squared plus y squared equals nine going counterclockwise from three zero to negative three zero. Stands to reason that if we then go from t equals pi to two pi, now we're going to do the lower half of that circle perhaps. Okay, well, we can see that when t is pi, then x is going to be negative three, y is going to be zero. And when t is two pi, x is going to be three, y is going to be zero. And if we tested an intermediate point like three pi over two, we'd learn that we were still going counterclockwise just like the one above. In fact, if you put these two things together and let t go from zero all the way to two pi, you'll end up drawing the whole circle counterclockwise. And I actually have no idea if I'm doing this counterclockwise for you based on where the camera is, but it's certainly counterclockwise for me. Well, what if we uh, swapped the formulas for X and Y? Now, if you're keeping up with this, 
you'll recognize that this is still producing a portion of the circle x squared plus y squared equals nine. We you know, still have the same gimmick. We can square both of these, we can add them up, we can employ everybody's favorite trig identity, and we'll end up with x squared plus y squared equals nine. If we go test the endpoints of zero and pi and maybe an intermediate point, because of this switcheroo of sine t and cosine t in the x and y formulas, we are now traversing this circle or this semicircle clockwise from zero three up and over to zero negative three, this way, clockwise, whatever way, okay? Uh, and then if we, whoops, I popped up that bar at the bottom. Uh, if we take the same formulas, x is three cosine t, y is three, sorry, x is three sine t, y is three cosine t, but this time we let t go from minus pi over two to pi over two. Well, turns out, once again, it's the circle x squared plus y squared equals nine, and now we go clockwise from the negative x-axis over to the positive x-axis. And you know, you can pause this and tinker with those values if you need to. Uh, a very quick run through the pictures, those examples. So x is three cosine t, y is three sine t, but t goes from pi to two pi. We've gotten the lower half of that circle of radius three. Do the switcheroo of the formulas for x and y, it's still the same circle, but this, whoops, those arrows are, one, one of those is backwards. It's supposed to be going down like this clockwise. So I didn't realize that arrow there was flipped around the wrong way. Um, and then if we change those bounds for t equals negative pi over two to positive pi over two, now we're going clockwise from the negative to the positive x-axis. So you can clip out all sorts of segments along the arc, or arcs uh, around a circle with good starting and ending points in whichever direction you wanna go just by the proper arrangement of your functions for X and Y and the starting and stopping values of T. Again, that's the power of parametric equations. This last example, finally, right? Uh, shows something a little bit different. We still see the sine and the cosine as those equations. And if you dive in too quick and I'm gonna square both sides right away, you'll see that you're not prepared to use that identity because you're gonna have a different multiple of sine squared than you do of cosine squared. And that kind of spoils the whole thing. So let's prepare for this handshake and say, man, I wish this two wasn't attached to the sine and I wish this three wasn't attached to the cosine because then I could square both of these and add them up and use everybody's favorite trig identity. Well, who's in charge? We're in charge. If we want this two off of the left-hand side, we can divide it to the, sorry, if we want it off of the right-hand side, we can divide both sides by two, get it over to the left-hand side. Uh, since this case, t is going from zero to two pi, the first and last points are both at zero three. So we are doing a full circuit around whatever curve this is. But here we go. Uh, we've divided the x equation by two. We've divided the y equation by three. Now we're ready to square both sides and add them up. And we get x over two squared plus y over three squared equals one. And you might remember this is an ellipse, okay? And again, if you wanna pause and practice, go in there and determine the x and y intercepts, determine whatever cool information um, about this you want. Decide if we move around it clockwise or counterclockwise. And here's the answer. but this time it's an ellipse, written parametrically, pretty cleanly and nicely. And then just a little bit of fun to finish things off. Uh, this trig identity, sine squared plus cosine squared is one, is decoded a few of our parametric equations already, and it's the key to decoding many more, right? So x equals five sine t, y equals five cosine t, even without starting and stopping values of t, we know that this is gonna produce either part or all of x squared plus y squared equals 25. So it's part of a circle. Now here's another identity that you possibly have been introduced to in the past. I'm pretty sure you have if you're at the point where you're doing parametric equations. You may remember these weirdo functions with the x or h in there. This identity can help decouple uh, parametric equations. And even if we don't decouple one, let's just throw them in as parametric equations. Now pause and just keep in mind, 
are generic trig functions sine t and cosine t. When they were used as parametric equations in this manner, we got a circle. Now, and there was that trig identity helping us do that. Here we have two parametric equations created using these other weirdo functions. And we would like to use this identity to handshake them, okay? Instead of the old fashioned regular trig identity. Now, let's square both of them, but this time let's subtract them so that we get x squared plus y, or sorry, x squared minus y squared is four times this weirdo cosine squared minus this weirdo sine squared. This identity tells us that's one. And so this equation right here is equivalent to x squared minus y squared equals four, not x squared plus y squared. Do you remember the name of that kind of curve? It is called a hyperbola. Do you remember what this H stood for in terms of how we named these functions? This one is called the hyperbolic cosine function. This was called the hyperbolic sine function. When we use them as fundamental building blocks of a pair of parametric equations like this, we generate a hyperbola. And so if you ever wondered where that H came from, this is one of the symptoms of the reason that we call these hyperbolic trig functions. Okay, I just, I said all this already. So, and here's a picture. The original um, domain here for t was just t is greater than or equal to zero. Uh, this function, these both of these functions get huge as t gets bigger and bigger. Um, and so we can't draw it for every t greater than or equal to zero. Uh, mechanically for this plotting, if I cut off t at two, uh, the curve still goes out of the window, but we can at least still see some of this curve. You can see that hyperbolic shape starting to build there. And if I allow t to start at negative two, uh, then we can see that we've got a fully developed hyperbolic shape coming from these parametric equations. That's pretty cool. Okay, so that is your whirlwind tour of parametric equations. How do they work? Why do they work? Why do we care about them? And how do we recognize a better or more familiar form of parametric functions if we need to get them? You saw a few tricks to, to go through that. So I hope this helped. Um, yeah, that's it. I've got no more slides, which is good because my timer says 32 minutes and 40 seconds. This is way too long of a video. Ugh. Thanks for hanging in there.